Joining us today is Peter Bill. Peter, welcome to the program. Thanks, nice. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you here. And, uh, well, why don't you tell us who you are? Okay. <laughs> well, my name's Peter Bell. I run a company called Systems Forge with offices in New York and Edinburgh. And I'm probably best known for presenting on domain-specific modeling and code generation. I'm on the program committee for the DSM workshop at Uppsala and also for code generation in Cambridge, England. And I've also presented at both conferences. And I present at 10 to 12 conferences around the world, primarily on code generation and agile development. Well, so today we're actually going to be speaking about domain-specific modeling, clearly, mm -hmm. having you as an expert here. <laughs> and uh, I think we start with this question, what is domain-specific modeling? I think a good practical definition of domain-specific modeling is using domain-specific languages for generating or, or developing some or all of your applications to raise the level of abstraction and to speed the process of firstly developing them and then maintaining them on an ongoing basis. Uh, okay, so what is the main specific language? Uh, okay, so I've defined something with another, another buzzword. So a domain specific language to me has three key components. It's domain specific. It's not a general purpose programming language like Java or PHP. It's something that's specifically designed to solve a subset of computational problems. The second thing is that it is raising the level of abstraction. There's no point having a DSL that is as verbose as writing the same thing in Java or C Sharp. And then finally, it does need to be executable. So mm -hmm. unlike, say, a ubiquitous language in DDD, a domain-specific language has to be executable. It has to be something that can either generate code or be interpreted down to a running application. Okay, so that is the difference between ubiquitous language and domain-specific language, right? The executable nature. I exactly, because as, as Eric Evans said in the book, ubiquitous languages may be executable, mm -hmm. but they don't need to be. So DSM is focusing on the subset of use cases where you know enough about the domain that it makes sense to build the tooling to generate straight from your ubiquitous language, and you get a number of benefits when you do that. Okay, so a true ubiquitous language is, I mean, you get a true ubiquitous language when you hear it spoken on the project. You look at the code and you see it in the code. So would that be an executable ubiquitous language? Would be, that be a DSL? Um, yes, but it, it raises a really interesting distinction in the DSM world between internal and external DSLs. Uh -huh. With an internal domain-specific language, say you've got an API with calls mm -hmm. or you're using some of the language constructs in Ruby or Groovy to, to create uh, human-readable DSLs within your code, the, the distinction is that you don't get all of the benefits of domain-specific modeling just with internal DSLs because you can still throw in bits of custom code. You still have to worry about syntactic issues. And so... The benefits of an external DSL, which is where you're moving your domain-specific language outside of the code and you're providing some kind of tooling for writing these DSL statements. It could be a boxes and arrows kind of diagramming tool. It could be a textual-based tool where you uh, type in the text maybe into Eclipse or into some other kind of, of system. Or it could even be uh, perhaps a spreadsheet or something else, depending upon the nature of the information you're trying to capture. The benefit of external DSLs is that they tend to be, it's a little more work to develop them in the first place, but it gives you a lot more power. You can often, once you've tested the generator, you don't often need to test the individual statements. So it raises the speed of development and the speed of maintenance for applications when you move to external rather than internal in-language DSLs. Okay, speaking of benefits, well, you mentioned a couple. Are there any other benefits? Yeah, the, the, there's a number of benefits from applying DSM mm -hmm. in, in, for the right use cases. Uh, probably the biggest one for me is just cutting down on the amount of testing because you can, you don't have to, the, the challenge is that even if you've got a good ubiquitous language and so you've got good communication between the stakeholders and the programmers, you still have this 
impedance mismatch. You still have this uh, translation process where the programmers have to take the ubiquitous language and turn it into code. And of course, bugs can arise there, misunderstandings can arise mm. there, and there's often issues where what was communicated isn't always what was built. Right. Whereas with domain-specific modeling, that completely disappears. You communicate with the stakeholder, you type in what they said, and then the code runs. And providing, again, your generator is well-formed, you don't need to worry about testing every single statement because if you've expressed your intent clearly, that is the intent that will be executed in the code. So the concern uh, is purely linguistic then. Is your language right? If your language is right, then you don't need any tests. Well, and then there's also tests for the semantics, which is the semantics right. in DSM will typically be the generator or an interpreter to make sure that a statement, given statement in the language, does what is expected. And of course you need a set of test cases for covering likely variabilities in language constructs and in statements and in constraints, but you don't necessarily need to test every single statement. Okay, so then given that I'm assuming the speed of application development goes up quite considerably, right? That's really the, exactly. You're investing a little more time up front into be able to A, build the applications more mm -hmm. quickly, B, maintain them more easily because now instead of having to go back after six months and trying to remember what this block of code did, you've got statements in the ubiquitous language that are describing clearly your intent and that is the code that you need to maintain. Okay, so with benefits, there are always trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And so one of the trade-offs I would imagine happening is, well, you thought your ubiquitous, I mean, your language was... Uh, not going to change, and it, or well, maybe that's not what you thought. It always does. But let's say your language, your understanding of the model changed mm -hmm. as you're working with the domain for a while. Your understanding of the domain changes. Your model changes as a result. Your language changes. How difficult is to propagate this change throughout your generated application with existing tools? Well, the, the interesting thing is that. There's no question that uh, th th there's not, for instance, simple refactoring support. You can't just say, I'm making this grammatical change, press this button, and regenerate my application with an understanding of that. Although there is definitely research being done on that, mm -hmm. and that's something that, that I've certainly been doing some work on, and I know a number of other people have around the world. Uh, but there again, even though you get refactoring support, say you're working in Java and you're using Eclipse or IntelliJ, even though that provides you refactoring support, if the fundamental structure of the underlying grammar and the underlying API changes, you're probably not going to be able to refactor that painlessly either. So um, sure. if you fundamentally, one domain object has become three domain objects, there's no easy way to say, well, if these seven things are true, then transform this method call to another method call. So in practice, the level of refactoring support, even in Java or C Sharp, in the, in the statically typed languages that provide the best refactoring available, still doesn't solve that problem. Okay, so that is probably because in Java we may not deal with such a high-level concept, typically. Exactly, because you, you can refactor methods, you can refactor objects, but right. it doesn't have the concept of refactoring. Right, so there is another term, remodel, mm -hmm. and there is no uh, remodel button anywhere. So Exactly, guess... they still haven't added remodeling into Eclipse yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so, now I will say, however, that there is a little extra overhead with domain-specific modeling. You have either an interpreter or a generator, as well as the, the, the grammar itself, the meta model, and, and the constraints. So in addition to having to refactor your statements, you also have to redescribe the, the grammar, redescribe the constraints, and tweak your interpreter and or generator. So typically, if you've got a very, very fluid domain that you know very little about, you might want to just start by building up some low-level libraries. You might want to start by creating some high-level languages to play with, but you may decide not to generate or, or interpret all of your language using DSLs until you have a more stable domain. Okay, so let's talk about misconceptions. Um, and, well, I have heard various statements about DSM, and one of them is, 
it has to start with UML. Right, and I, I think that's probably the most harmful misconception, <laughs> unfortunately, for, for the whole domain-specific modeling world, which is if I'd started DSM using UML and MDA, I probably wouldn't use it because it, it, it's, it's a noble effort and it's, it's a system that is being used successfully by many people around the world. But the challenge is that UML, while bringing many, many benefits trying to shoehorn general purpose UML diagrams with stereotypes and the like to describe domain concepts that really have nothing to do with classes and methods or should have nothing to do with classes and methods. We don't want one box per class or we're not raising the level of abstraction. We're just drawing pictures instead of typing text. So you, then, then when you start to look at the output you get from a lot of the UML tools, which you then want to apply model-to-model -model transforms to and then use to model-to-text generate your code, it's not easy to work with things like XMI. So I think that it's important to realize that UML and MDA is really only a small subset of the domain-specific modeling world, and the more interesting things are being done with companies like MetaCase, JP Tovin and Steve Kelly, uh, some of the work that Open Architecture Wear is a plug-in for Eclipse that allows you to describe your grammar and constraints, and it will generate right there a plug-in for you for allowing your developers to develop textual DSLs, and it's much, much easier to work with than a, a full UML MDA approach. DSL has to be domain expert writable. Yeah, and I think this is where a lot of the concerns about DSM comes, that we're trying to write this thing where your secretary is going to write the accounting <laughs> system by the end of the month. It is possible to use DSM approaches to create domain expert writable code. And if you look at Excel and some of the things that domain experts do in Excel, domain experts can write code for solving specific computational problems. But you can get a lot of the benefits of domain-specific modeling just from domain expert readable code. It's about creating code where your domain experts can understand what you've written and then it executes so that you don't have that miscommunication between the domain expert and the programmer. It, it's similar to the benefits you get from a ubiquitous language, but it's removing that additional step where the programmer then implements the, execute, uh, the uh, ubiquitous language and you may get into trouble where their implementation wasn't what the domain expert has expected. Yeah, I have a little bit of experience with... Uh writing unit tests, well, they were really scenario sort of tests that I'm, I was sharing with a domain expert. And, of course, domain expert might be struggling and did with a little bit of syntactic noise that Java forces upon you. But I was trying to express the unit tests mm -hmm. in the ubiquitous language. That is, how, you know, this is how I define my model, and these are the statements I'm trying to make. Could you please tell me if they make sense like that? So I'm just imagining that with a DSL, that would be a much, much easier and more beneficial and quicker thing to do. Definitely. And you're seeing examples of this already when you look at behavior-driven development. So in right. Ruby, you've got RSpec. In Java, you've got jbehave. I think version 2 came out a couple yeah. months back. It's a great example. In that case, it's more integration-level testing, but it's a great example of a, a DSL where you're saying, given this, these things should happen. And it's giving you a language that domain experts can look at, and especially... Uh, I, I think in both jbehave, but certainly in RSpec, and uh, there's even versions of this for Groovy, Cold Fusion, a number of different languages, it gives you very readable integration tests that a domain expert can understand. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future. Lovely. Well, another uh, statement that not only did I hear from other people, but this is something I kind of glimpsed from what you just said. Uh, given that you have to really know the domain and have it not change very rapidly underneath you to take full advantage of uh, DSM, do I have to do a really heavy upfront analysis? And, and that's a great question. And I don't think anyone these days is advocating big design upfront for, for most projects. So 
Something that, that again, is, is a research effort and a focus in the DSM community is about making the domain-specific modeling more agile. Again, I mean, the, the, probably the best tooling example of that would be Meta Edit Plus from MetaCase, where they've got really quite rich support, because there are a number of problems you have to solve when you start uh, having more frequent changes to your model. You run into issues like, okay, well, if I change my model, I still need to be able to load statements that were valid in the old model but invalid in the new ones mm -hmm. and have some kind of tooling that's going to help me. Either it's going to automatically apply the transforms or it's going to help me with a, I'm sorry, this model is invalid, I'll load it, but you've got to tweak a couple of things and giving you some kind of information about what and where you need to tweak. Really the only out-of-the-box tooling that does that today is, is MetaEdit Plus, uh, although it's definitely an area that I, th I think the other guys are focused on. So there's no question that DSM is not just about big design up front. It can be done in an agile manner. But today with the tooling, there's also a realistic understanding that if you have no knowledge of your domain and it's going to be changing wildly and you have very few statements in it, you're probably not going to get a return on investment from the additional effort. Another statement that I hear sometimes is you ought to generate your entire application using DSM. Well, there, there, there's a number of conceptions, really two main conceptions around generation of applications in that way. One is that you should generate the entire application, and the other is that you can't ever generate the entire application. Uh, and I'd argue that both of those are wrong. It is possible to generate 100% of your application. Uh, if nothing else, you just take uh, text files and use a one-to-one -one transformation, or you just FTP the files across. You take your templates with no variables, you can generate an entire application. In practice, it doesn't always make sense to generate all of the code. And there are a number of tools in the DSM and code generation world, from protected blocks, which are uh, pretty painful, right up to subclassing, AOP, event-driven programming, that you can use to separate your generated code from your custom code so that it's easy to put both of those into an application. So you don't need to generate 100% of the application, although it is technically possible to do so. And usually I'd recommend that people start by, again, looking for the areas where the domain model is fairly rich, is somewhat stable, and they have lots and lots of statements they need to communicate uh, with domain experts because then they can get the full advantage of the extra effort to, to create the DSM tooling around those areas. What projects are more suitable for domain-specific modeling? It's, it's a great question. I would say there's a few things that will make a project more suitable for DSM. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's not mentioned often is DSM expertise within your team. Uh, just like when you start working with maybe Spring and putting uh, point cuts and advice using AOP into a project, you're raising the bar in terms of the kind of programmer that's going to be able to work with that. Similarly, if you move to a dynamic language, you start using Groovy or Ruby, and you put mix-ins and you know, partial classes in C-sharp. As you start doing these dynamic things, mm -hmm. you can create elegant applications very quickly, but you can also make them very difficult to maintain if your developers aren't, aren't versed in these techniques. Even simple things like closures, if a developer hasn't seen a closure before, they're going to get a little freaked out the first time they start working with some groovy code. So one thing to look for is that you have at least somebody on your team with DSM experience or bring in a consultant to get you going, because it really does help. Then some of the other things you're going to be looking for is either within a project or over a number of projects, if you are working in a consulting capacity, there needs to be some areas of the domain that you're going to be using long enough to get this return on investment. Right. It's a little bit like the old pragmatic programmers thing, how you write something three times and then you write a tool to handle that thing. Well, there's enough overhead in DSM, maybe you want to be writing it six times. But at some point, you're going to get to that point where it makes much more sense to have an external DSL or some tooling to take care of that class of problem. And it's important to realize that domains can be horizontal as well as vertical. So a vertical domain, if you do all of your work for one insurance company, or you work with 20 different mortgage brokers, then you're probably going to have a domain that relates to insurance with uh, or, or mortgages and that has a set of terms around that. 
but equally valid at Systems Forge, we generate semi-custom web applications. So we spend our the horizontal domains we work with are incredibly varied. It can be e-commerce for a mm -hmm. dress shop, or it can be a document repository for a law firm. But in all of those cases, we have a horizontal or technical domain that doesn't change. We have models, controllers, validations, relationships, and we have a series of DSLs we use for quickly developing our web applications in that horizontal domain. And my experience has been that most developers, whether they're working for one company or a bunch of them, can find areas that they work in that they could leverage domain-specific modeling to build, A, to build the applications quicker, and B, to make it so much easier to maintain. Because now when they go back to work with this, they're not looking at a bunch of Java code. They're looking at a few statements that concisely express the intent. What would you call um, Hibernate a DSL? I, I would absolutely say that Hibernate exposes one or more DSLs for dealing with object relational mapping. And absolutely, that's a great example of... Uh, a lot of people sometimes ask, how do you start developing these languages? And my answer is, steal them. <laughs> <laughs> Why develop a language? If you're dealing with, especially if you're dealing with horizontal concepts, if you're dealing with object relational mapping, dependency injection, AOP... There's lots of languages for describing that stuff already. So start with somebody else's language and then provide your own simplified or customized language on top of that that takes the subset that's relevant for your use cases. And even with horizon uh, horizontal DSLs, there's lots of XML schemas can be mm -hmm. a great starting point. There are XML schemas for areas of banking and insurance, and, and, and most industries have a number of schemas and DSLs really already developed. Start with an industry standard and then look at the subset and customize it as you need for your specific conditions. This sort of resonates with, uh, well, with the way you deal with um, a particular domain where maybe there is some published books on the domain subject and instead of hallucinating your own ideas about what the uh, core concepts are, you can just read about this and then well, I, I think, and, and that's what, what I really love about this, is domain-specific modeling and domain-driven design seem to me to go hand in hand. Domain-driven design is one of the core concepts, and there are many others, but one of the core concepts at DDD is about elicit, approaches for eliciting ways of getting your domain-specific language or your ubiquitous language. And then in the DSM world, they have all of this experience of saying, okay, we got this ubiquitous language, here are some ways of efficiently using that to generate or interpret code. And I'm looking forward to seeing, and I, I think there's already a lot more discussion between the two communities, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of that because the DSM community could learn a lot from DDD in terms of doing a better job of designing elegant language. And I think the DDD community could learn a little from the DSM community in terms of making more of their languages executable. Well, thank you very much, Peter. This was Peter Bell. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.